tax policy, thinking about the high level um, implications of tax policy on the economy. Uh, and from a sort of a, a bigger picture perspective, uh, we will be having five of these sessions over the next, every Friday over the next few weeks to talk about uh, in this session, a broad overview about how to think about tax policy uh, and then diving into specific elements of the federal tax code, including individual income taxes next week, and corporate income taxes, and then diving into specifically applications uh, of uh, to tax policy, specifically uh, in the context of coronavirus response and the many debates in Washington about how to uh, improve or reform our tax code. Uh, and of course, tax policy has been a really salient uh, part of the broader policy discussion over the past uh, couple uh, of uh, uh, years now, uh, since the 2017 tax law, uh, especially in, in the context of coronavirus response. And now, of course, with the election of President Joe Biden. Uh, and so this is all a very relevant topic um, for many of us in, in various uh, various uh, places in Washington, both from a public policy perspective, also, uh, of course, in the private sector and in uh, in think tanks. So excited to be with you today. And we're going to start sort of at the very beginning uh, to give you an overview of both how the economy works uh, and uh, how tax policy interacts with it uh, to give you uh, a good sense of, of how we'll be uh, building from a solid foundation uh, in the weeks ahead, specifically looking at different components of the tax code. And so to, to dive in here, we'll give you a, uh, a, a, a overview of the agenda for today specifically. Uh, we're, Eric and I will be going back and forth reviewing each of these different topics. Feel free if you have questions throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation uh, to put that in the Q&A functionality in Zoom at the bottom. Uh, we will uh, mostly be answering questions at the end. We'll have at least 15 minutes there to do that. Uh, though, if you do have a question right away, we can try to get to that. We do want this to be uh, you know, a conversation as well as, as a presentation of this material. Uh, so Erica here in a moment, we'll kick it off with uh, a review of the basics of GDP, our national accounting, a high level review of how we think about uh, the economy. Uh, I will be covering how economists think about uh, economic growth and modeling the economy. Uh, we'll then transition halfway through the presentation about how taxes impact the economy, how economists tend to think about that and the many ways in which taxes can affect uh, growth, output, workers uh, and investment. Uh, and then I will wrap up with a short review of some of the major tax models out there in Washington, how they work, some of their differences, things to think about, as well as trying to uh, rethink some of the common misconceptions about tax policy. So with that, uh, that agenda in mind, I'll turn it over to my colleague Erica to uh, review uh, our favorite topic, which is GDP and national accounting. Thanks, Garrett, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So like Garrett said, we'll start with this high level view of um, what goes on in the economy and how we measure it. And then, then we'll turn to how tax policy affects that. So just starting with the very basics, um, GDP, gross domestic product, is an accounting identity, and it shows the market value of final goods and services produced within our borders, typically within a year. Um, there's also quarterly measures. The GDP measurement is um, an expenditures approach, so it adds up all of the final spending in the economy uh, from consumers, investors, government, and foreigners, and it's detailed on the, the product side of the national income and product accounts. So it starts with adding up consumption spending. That's like the stuff that you and I buy every day, the coffee you buy on the way to work or the haircut that you're hoping to get when things get back to normal and we can get haircuts again. Um, it also includes investment spending. And that can be thought of as generally the things that businesses buy like tractors or machinery. It also includes some consumer um, purchases which are final or brand new residential home purchases. The category of investment excludes some things that businesses buy, like intermediate goods. So if a bakery were to buy eggs and flour, that wouldn't be counted in GDP because that's not a final goods or service. The bakery is going to use the eggs and flour to make the cake. And when that's sold to a consumer, that would be the, the final um, purchase that's counted in GDP. Government spending is also included. So the pens and paper that you buy for your office are counted here, as well as bigger things like military spending and direct purchases um, state and local governments make like roads and bridges and, and repairs there. GDP also includes an adjustment for exports and imports. So some of the things that we've already counted either in consumption investment or government expenditure may have been purchased abroad. 
And um, you could think of like a, a bottle of wine from France that wasn't made in the United States. So that doesn't count in our GDP because it was made abroad. So we subtract imports. Uh, we also make things and sell them to, to other countries. And so we add exports and together the, the adding exports and subtracting imports is referred to as net exports. In the United States, personal consumption makes up about 67% of GDP. Investment makes up about 17 and a half percent of GDP. Government, government expenditures also make up about 17 and a half percent of GDP. And we tend to import more than we export. So net exports is actually a subtraction of about 3%. And just a note on that, um, imports are subtracted because GDP is counting up the things that are produced in the United States and imports are foreign produced. That doesn't mean imports are bad though. Um, it's just an accounting definition. Sometimes we can get tripped up and think, oh, imports are a subtraction, imports are bad. But if we said, let's reduce imports, we would by definition either be reducing some consumption, some investment or some government expenditure and GDP would not be changing at all. So GDP is just accounting for things. It's not explaining why the economy gets bigger or why it gets smaller. We can go to the next slide. Another way to measure the activity that happens in the United States is by looking at all the income generated in production. And so this is detailed on the income side of, of the accounts. We can think of GDP as the spending that happens and we can think of GDI, gross domestic income as the receiving end of that spending. So gross domestic income is calculated by adding up compensation that employees receive. That would be things like your wages as well as non-wage benefits like health insurance. GDI also includes net operating surplus. That's a measure of profits that are mostly from private enterprises, but it also includes government enterprises. Um, it's things like proprietor's income, corporate income, interest income, and rents. But a large portion of national income goes directly to the government. It doesn't ever reach someone's pocketbook. That's accounted for in national accounts under two main categories. Uh, the first is called taxes on production and imports. That comprises mostly state and local taxes that, that businesses pay, as well as federal excise taxes. And then the second category is called taxes on corporate income, and that's straightforward. It's um, the sum of corporate income taxes paid. These categories don't include personal income taxes, though. They just include the taxes that are um, coming out of business profits. And further, um, some national income never accrues to businesses or even to the government. Some income is lost as our possessions wear down. Um, machines break, buildings become dilapidated, software becomes obsolete, and those things require repair or replacement, and that costs money. And so this is um, in the category of consumption of fixed capital or depreciation. And you can think of it kind of like an anti-income. Um, it's, it's an expense that effectively cancels out the revenues that either um, income that individuals or firms or governments receive and said it's set aside to replace that worn down capital. And so all of those things together equal gross domestic income. There's a few interesting trends in gross domestic income and Garrett might mention some of these later, um, but just high level um, things that are worth noting. Benefits like health insurance account for a growing share of labor compensation. And as we'll probably get to in the coming weeks, um, especially when we talk about the individual income tax code next week, there's a tax angle for, for that trend. Um, about a quarter of income goes to those business level taxes and the replacement of worn out machinery. And then if we look at the measure of net income after subtracting out those business level taxes and depreciation, labor compensation makes up about 69% of that net income measure. And that's really remained um, almost surprisingly consistent over decades. So just a few, few, few notes on that. And we can go to the next slide. So um, GDI counts receiving, GDP counts the spending. And in concept, these, these two measures are measuring the same economic activity, but in practice, they can differ a little bit because they're constructed using different data sources. So you can see that on, on the screen here, um, they represent two sides of the ledger. They generally add up to close to the same amount, but there's a bit of statistical discrepancy between the two. And together they make up the national income and product accounts. And we can go to the next slide. So together, the information in the national accounts helps us see what's going on in the economy. 
For instance, one thing that we can see from the equations is that the trade deficit has more to do with national saving than other factors. So sorry for you know, all the algebra here on the screen, but we're already familiar with this first equation. That's the expenditure approach to GDP, which we've also shown is equal to income. The relationship between saving and net exports can be confirmed using the equations of national accounts. One of the most basic accounting identities is that saving equals investment plus net exports. So we're just gonna move the terms around a little bit. Um, we're gonna put personal and government expenditures on the left side. So that first term that you see in parentheses, um, that's income minus your personal consumption minus taxes paid to the government. So that equals private saving. The second term is government savings, which can be thought of as the difference between taxes that the government brings in and spending that the government sends out. And as we all know, um, that, that typically um, is negative because our, our government is running a budget deficit. So the, the last equation there, we can combine private saving and government saving to get a total national saving, which is represented by the S in the equation. So what happens if we increase our national saving? When America as a whole saves more, um, it, can go, it can go one of two places. Uh, first, it can um, be used to fund the production of domestic investments. That's things like factories or, or shopping malls. Second, it can be used to, to increase net exports. Uh, said, said another way, um, it can be used to acquire net financial assets from foreigners, and that's done by increasing the amount of goods and services we export. This also shows that saving can fall and that a capital inflow from foreigners could fund investment rather than investment having to fall due to lower domestic savings. And that, that would be facilitated through the balance of trade. This relationship shows that imports don't cause GDP to be low, but rather imports happen when the things that we want to buy, our domestic consumption, outstrips our domestic production. So the trade deficit could be thought of as a symptom of insufficient domestic production rather than a cause of it. So to sum that all up, um, national accounts tell us what's going on in the economy. They tell us either how much we're producing or how much we're making in income but they don't really explain why or, or what drives increases or decreases in, in production or income. And for that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Garrett. Thanks, Erica. And as Erica just, just mentioned, uh, these are all, of course, like accounting identities. So they are uh, not really theories of how the economy works. Uh, they're just uh, statements of, of fact, right? And you can rearrange them to, to discover interesting relationships or, or thinking about those relationships in a new way, uh, which can be a really helpful tool when thinking about uh, relationships between, for example, imports and exports uh, and, and the domestic economy. And so moving to uh, from the accounting relationship between expenditures and income, uh, which of course can be summed even more simply as just uh, your one person spending is another person's income, uh, we can also think about uh, why the economy uh, is uh, producing an output, uh, the output that it is producing. Uh, this, of course, uh, has been subject uh, of economic thought going all the way back to our favorite Adam Smith uh, when he wrote uh, his, his treatise in 1776 about the wealth of nations, about uh, not just why was economic output what it was in uh, England at the time, but also why were certain countries or areas even within uh, that country uh, performing better than others, right? Why was it producing more output uh, than other places? Uh, and so that requires, of course, some sort of formal or informal uh, model of how the economy works. Because before we can determine, particularly from a policy perspective, uh, what we should be doing to, uh, to change policy to help with improving economic growth, dynamism, fairness, right, equity, and whatever your goal is, you do have to have a common understanding of the economy. And of course, economics as a discipline in academia gets a lot of uh, it can be hard to parse through, but a big reason why that they do use a lot of mathematics and formal models is because they are trying to get at precise interrelationships between different aspects of the economy to get a better understanding of what types of levers can be used or can't be used uh, to improve economic outcomes. Uh, for this conversation, we're going to keep it pretty high level uh, to give you a sense of, and a lot of this will be sort of review for a lot of folks uh, who are uh, familiar with economics, but it can give us a, sort of a all sort of a same starting point in terms of understanding uh, how uh, GDP is determined. Uh, within uh, 
what is known as neoclassical or mainstream economics. Uh, a lot of models of GDP do use particular production functions. Uh, the one on the screen here uh, in, this, in this fabulous algebra is the Cobb-Douglas production function. Uh, but uh, to even back up a little further uh, before we get to that, uh, you may remember from uh, even like AP Econ, the four factors of production, right? Uh, land, labor, capital, a lot of folks also add in human capital and entrepreneurship. Those are sort of the key inputs that go into the economy to produce a certain level of output. And a lot of models of the economy, including this fancy Cobb-Douglas production, are just trying to establish what are the exact interrelationships between the particular inputs that are going in that produce a certain amount of output. And so with these factors in mind, we can think about each of them as particular uh, and important inputs that have uh, particular sensitivities to, to public policy, right? And have specific features about them that make them worth learning more about. So just to give a very simple example, uh, think about land, right? Land is unique in that it is in fixed supply. And that makes it very unique relative to labor and capital or even improvements on land that are not necessarily in uh, fixed supply. They can actually be increased. Uh, and that gets me to the two major inputs that determine GDP, but are not uh, exhaustive, of course, and that is labor, the workforce, and capital, which is all of the productive stuff or assets that are uh, being used to produce a certain level of output. Capital can include fixed assets, think of machinery, equipment, buildings, but it can also include uh, intangible items. And that's increasingly important in our uh, digital economy, in a service-based economy. You can think of anything like ranging from intellectual property, say a novel and effective way to inoculate people against a new virus. That's a really helpful uh, piece of capital, if, if you will. Um, and even items like brand or reputations also play a pretty critical role as assets for individual firms, right? You think about uh, particular brands that are iconic, uh, that's actually a helpful um, input for, for establishing production uh, and in particular competition for particular firms in the economy. And so before getting into the, the specifics of the Cobb Douglas, a really important insight that economists have uh, thought about over the last uh, century is that accumulating capital, also known as capital deepening, is a critical way in which economic output rises. We tend to find that workers that are more productive, that can produce more per hour of labor worked, tend to have higher standards of living and higher uh, economic output. And so finding ways to increase investment in capital over the long run can be a critical element in determining the long run uh, productivity of the economy and of course uh, living standards, though there is more to the story and that, that's important uh, when we'll get to that here in a moment. Uh, and so just to get back to this, this algebra here, all it's showing is that GDP is a, some function of L, which is labor and K, which is capital. And those exponents that you're seeing there on the side are merely how sensitive both labor and capital are uh, when you increase them to producing output. And so, if you double labor, for example, how much will that increase output? In certain contexts, it could double it. Um, in certain places, that can more than double it, right? Uh, and that is that relationship is known to economists as returns to scale. Uh, you'll also know, note this A here. We'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, that's really important uh, because uh, that picks up anything other than L and K that explain the relationship between labor and capital and output, right? So if you remember maybe from, from undergrad or grad school, uh, there's always in any estimate of a relationship between different variables, some remaining uh, amount that is unexplained. And that A basically picks up all the other unexplained amount or variation that's not being picked up by labor and capital. That is known by economists as total factor productivity. Fancy word, but basically it just means anything other than labor and capital that explains uh, the, uh, the growth trajectory of, uh, of a country. That can be really important. The economists, uh, William Easterly and Ross Levine in 2001 found that the average country, uh, their total factor productivity accounted for about 60% of growth uh, of output per worker. So it's a really important thing. And this is why I want to caveat very quickly that labor and capital are really important, but there are other elements that, that drive uh, economic outcomes as well. And the three that I want to highlight very quickly are technology, innovation rates are really important, critical, of course, to growth from the late 19th century uh, through the mid and late 20th centuries, for sure. Uh, that can be uh, what drives innovation and technology uh, is still subject to a lot of debate um, and uh, is really important and is actually um, uh, another reason why tax policy can be important as well on top of capital and labor effects. 
uh, human capital and entrepreneurship that I mentioned earlier, you know, the ability to take risk and spot opportunities to earn a profit in a market economy is a really important way to uh, establish, to break out of the existing, um, the existing status quo. It can create creative destruction, uh, the term uh, created by Joseph Schumpeter about 100 years ago. Uh, think about the classic case of the, of the motor vehicle out competing and destroying the, uh, the buggy, horse and buggy industry. Uh, that can produce um, uh, a, a shift in the economy above and beyond the existing capital and labor inputs. And the last one that's even probably the most nebulous of all is the role of institutions and culture, right? You can think of classically, it's often you know, stable property rights, uh, a consistent and predictable legal system, sound currency, among many other things that um, are used to determine how well an economy is set up for success in the long run. And then more specifically on the, the Cobb-Douglas, why do we use this? Why is it a helpful workhorse, if you will, for, for, for determining the relationship between labor and capital and economic output? Well, uh, it's actually, uh, we can use it uh, based on historical properties about how different uh, things, items within the economy have related to one another over time. Specifically, the share of returns that accrue to the two major factors of production, labor and capital, when you look at those, They've been fairly stable over the past 90 years, right? So you think about uh, the return to labor, that's very often salaries and wages. The portion of economic output that goes to salaries and wages versus the portion going to uh, the owners of capital, often in the, in the form of business profits. For example, in this, uh, this slide here, you have corporate profits. Uh, you have, of course, housing, which is partly a form of investment, partly a form of consumption, as well as um, Pass through or sole proprietor income, uh, that's remained roughly fixed. And that's important because what that means is if you increase the quantity of either labor or capital, we tend to see an increase in overall GDP. Theoretically, you could have one offset the other, but generally speaking, we have not seen that relationship for the past century. It has been the case that by improving capital, you get an improvement in uh, overall productivity and, a, and an increase in economic output. So another way of putting that is labor and capital are complementary inputs, and, and that's really important. So with that in mind about sort of high level, how the economy tends, tends to work and how we think about it from a, from a model perspective, I want to turn it over to Erica to talk about uh, how taxes play a role in all of this. So as, as Garrett just explained, uh, the size of the economy is determined by the amount of labor, number of hours people work, um, capital, how much equipment, building software and such is available to work with, and also um, technology, which is how efficiently we can combine labor and capital to, to make the things that people want. Um, there's, there's evidence that tax policy can have a substantial effect on decisions about how much people work and how much capital is needed. All existing tax systems contain some features that discourage work and discourage investment, which lead to a smaller economy. And there are a few ways that we can think about how tax policy affects the economy. The first that, that I'll go over is just a basic description of what happens when a government imposes a tax. And then we can talk about um, five different major effects that tax policy has on labor, saving capital and economic aggregates. So we can go to the next slide. Um, when a tax is imposed, it creates a wedge between the price you pay for something and the money you get for it. Um, for, for instance, your employer may pay you $100, but after taxes, you might receive $90. And so the tax created a wedge between what was paid and what was received. Tax wedges can increase prices, they can reduce activity, and they lead to dead weight loss. So an example of, of dead weight loss and how to think about that. Say that I want to buy a birthday cake. And I think that I would get $10 of enjoyment out of a birthday cake. And it just so happens at the local bakery, I can buy a birthday cake for $8. So $10 minus $8 is two. I would be better off by $2. There would be $2 of surplus value if I go ahead and buy this birthday cake. But now suppose that the government wants to impose a $3 excise tax on birthday cakes. And for the sake of simplicity, let's say that increases the price of the birthday cake by $3. So now it costs me $11 to buy a birthday cake. I only get $10 of enjoyment out of it. So I'm not gonna buy it. It's not a good deal for me. So now because of the tax that was imposed, the sale doesn't happen. I don't buy the cake. I'm not better off by $2. So there's this, there's no longer this $2 in surplus value floating around. And the government also doesn't get to collect any tax revenue because I didn't buy the cake. 
That activity that doesn't happen and that loss of surplus value is the deadweight loss of a tax. And no two taxes impact the economy the same way. One way that you can think about this is a hierarchy, which taxes are most and least harmful for long-term economic growth or which cause the most or least deadweight loss. This hierarchy is determined by which factors are most mobile and so most sensitive to tax rates. In other words, you can ask the question, if taxed, which factor could be easily moved, reduced, or otherwise changed to avoid the tax? Taxes on the most mobile factors of the economy, such as capital, cause the most distortions and have the most negative impact. And taxes on factors that can't easily be moved, such as land, are the most stable and the least distortive. So we can go to the next slide and ask the question, so how do taxes impact the economy? First, we can think of the incentives that taxes have on firms and workers in the economy. Federal tax policy can grow economic output by lowering marginal tax rates on work and investment. And that would encourage people to work more and business to invest more. The marginal tax rate is the amount of additional tax that would be paid for every additional dollar earned or additional hour worked or an additional investment made. And as, as Garrett mentioned earlier, um, this neoclassical theory that, that we're talking about is based on a claim about the substitution effect, which says if, if you make work cheaper relative to leisure, households will work more. And if you make investment cheaper relative to consumption, businesses will invest more. If a federal tax change doesn't affect marginal tax rates, it'll do little to help or hurt the economy because it's not affecting the incentives that households and businesses uh, face to, to change their decision making. So that's why that, that point there says it has little to do with how high taxes are or how low taxes are. It's that marginal incentive on, on the next hour of work or the next investment to be made. So when we think about taxes on labor supply, the more that workers get to keep the fruits of their labor rather than paying them in taxes, the more likely they are to work. We can think about saving. Um, the fewer additional taxes you pay on your saving, the more likely you are to save. And we can think about investment. Firms essentially have two choices on what to do with their cash. They can return their money to shareholders or they can reinvest it. Either choice is going to have a tax implication and the firm's decision can be changed as a result of the tax liabilities it would have in either case. You can go to the next slide. There are also a couple other ways that economists think taxes affect the economy. And both of these effects have to do with um, the budget deficit. So first, um, we think there could be, or, or some models or, or some theories think that um, there's an impact on aggregate demand. And aggregate demand is essentially about the exchange of money for goods and services. Higher aggregate demand means that there's more money moving around the economy looking for goods and services to purchase. Under this assumption, um, a tax cut would give people more money if, if it's, um, yeah, yeah, a tax cut would give people more money and that could increase aggregate demand, which in the short term could lead to more hiring as there's more money chasing around after goods and services. We tend to be a little bit skeptical of this assumption, especially over the long term, that, that tax cuts will generate new aggregate demand without being offset by a monetary policy, but that does require making some um, assumptions about how the Federal Reserve would respond. You can also think about the impact of a budget deficit on the supply of saving available to entrepreneurs and businesses. This effect is often referred to as the crowding out effect. So if you imagine that governments need to find people to lend to them to finance a budget deficit, but so do entrepreneurs and so do businesses, they need to find people to lend to them to make productive investments. There could be a problem if a government deficit um, soaked up some of the, the available saving and so um, businesses and entrepreneurs didn't have that saving available to them. We also tend to be a little bit skeptical of of this assumption that, that most of the change in, in the desired borrowing would have to be financed by domestic savers because we think that foreign savers through the balance of trade, like we talked about earlier with those accounting identities can lend more to the United States if necessary. So we can go to the next slide and think through um, the in incentive effects of, of three different example of tax changes. So first we can think about a um, cut in the corporate income tax rate. This would impact the incentive to invest by changing the service price of capital. It would lower the cost of, of making investments, 
which would um, tend to mean more investments become viable at this lower after-tax cost. And a higher level of investment would increase the capital stock, so the things like um, plant and machinery and equipment that workers have to work with, and that would lead to higher productivity and higher economic output over the long term. We could also think about an increase in the capital gains tax rate. An increase in the capital gains tax rate would primarily affect the return to saving, though it would also have some effect on um, the return to capital, especially for pass-through firms that, that might not have access to um, foreign savings. So lower levels of saving and lower levels of investment would reduce economic output and lower levels of saving would also reduce the American ownership of investments as foreigners would make up some of the difference when Americans reduce their saving. So in, in the case of a capital gains tax cut or tax rate increase, um, we, we would see that effect on, on return to saving and return to investment. We can also think about a cut in the payroll tax rate. And this would primarily affect um, the, the return to labor. It would increase the return to labor. So that would incentivize additional hours of work. And an increase in the supply of labor would also lead to an increase in economic output. So when we're thinking about tax changes, we should primarily be thinking about the incentives that they change um, for people's decisions to work or to save or to invest. And I'll hand it over to Garrett to talk about um, how these things are actually modeled. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, and I think it's a, a very helpful to think about uh, these economic models uh, in uh, the short run versus the long run. And our focus and emphasis and emphasis of a lot of economics work, of course, is the impact of tax and other policy changes on long run impacts. Uh, though, of course, economic output can deviate from, from its potential in the short run uh, through the business cycle, right? And so there are various theories uh, that are often mutually exclusive about what drives the business cycle and how to best respond to it. Erica mentioned, of course, uh, the, uh, the theory about the loss of aggregate demand known as, as, as Keynesian theory and how, to, uh, how fiscal monetary policy can help offset that. There's, of course, of course alternative ways in which uh, downturns can happen. For example, uh, what is known as a, a real shock to the economy. The coronavirus pandemic is a great example. You have, you have lockdowns and uh, restrictions on economic activity and changes in behavior that are going to reduce economic output. And this all does uh, play a role in uh, the modeling and assumptions we make about how any given tax change is going to impact the economy, uh, both from a short run perspective through an increase in, in demand. Uh, and in the long run perspective, which is tend to, tends to be our focus on changing incentives on the margin, which are going to impact incentives both to invest, to save, and to work, as, as Erica just outlined. Uh, and so with that, with that context in mind, it, it is helpful to get, from a very high level, uh, a sense of the different uh, types of modeling, particularly in Washington, that look particularly at tax legislation uh, at the federal level. And there are um, a bunch of different groups uh, think tanks in town, as well as others uh, in academia, of course, who try to look at, in particular, the uh, effects of tax legislation, specifically the impact of, of that legislation on, uh, on revenue for the federal government that is often shown uh, through what is known as the budget window over 10 years. So, for example, if we were to say this tax change from, you know, th this particular tax bill would uh, increase federal revenue by $1 trillion, that is very often uh, being refer referred to over 10 years. So it's uh, not necessarily 100 billion, it could be uh, not evenly distributed, but it's gonna be in total over that 10 years, 1 trillion, not 1 trillion per year. Uh, if it was 1 trillion per year, plus some, it should be at least 10 trillion is the way you would refer to that score. Uh, and the on the revenue side, you will often hear uh, the uh, re reference to dynamic scoring. Now, before we get to dynamic scoring, we have to contextualize it with conventional or static scoring. What is that? Uh, as a lot of folks who are probably familiar with, if you work on the Hill or are close to it uh, and, and know about scoring on the Hill, uh, there is uh, there are a few different bodies within the federal government that help uh, policymakers determine from a sort of objective perspective or as objective as you can get the impact of tax legislation on revenue. Uh, and that, uh, that includes, uh, but it's not, not exhaustive, um, the Congressional Budget Office or CBO, uh, which works with Congress to determine overall sort of big picture uh, impacts on specific legislation and in particular how the federal government is, is uh, uh, how they're doing with, in regards to their budget and the interaction with how the economy is doing, because that's an important input for how much revenue they will raise in any given year. 
and then specifically the uh, Joint Committee on Taxation, uh, which is, uh, a, as the name implies, uh, a committee with both chambers of Congress, uh, with professional staff um, who are trying to estimate the impact, particularly of taxation, on federal revenue. And so a lot of the uh, groups that do scoring try to replicate or follow very closely to guidelines uh, that the JCT and CBO use. Uh, to establish how much revenue any given tax change will make. And that's typically known as a, as a conventional score. Conventional scores are really helpful, but the one thing they tend to lack is they tend to assume that the size of the economy remains static. That's why it's also known as a static score. It is not taking into account how uh, the economy and economic output will change based on any given tax change. To do that, you have to introduce dynamics into the modeling, hence the term dynamic scoring, which is going to add to the conventional score that impact of the change in economic output to uh, federal revenue. And so that's what dynamic scoring is trying to get at. Uh, we would argue that that is a more realistic assessment of how any given tax policy change will impact the economy. It also gives you a better sense of the trade-offs, right? Both from reduced economic output, which may reduce long run after tax incomes, and of course the reduction in revenue as a result of an increase in, in tax, or uh, very often um, the uh, relative change in revenue because of a decrease in tax, right? Um, this does require the caveat uh, that uh, it is very rare, if ever, that any given tax policy change pays for itself. You may have heard, heard of that. Uh, it comes up a lot in the context of dynamic scoring, though often it is a straw man because uh, both the Tax Foundation and most other groups do not uh, make the argument that any given tax cut will more than offset itself in terms of the impact on federal revenue. More often, the, the reduction in federal revenue for any given tax cut will be smaller than the conventional score, but it will not be a strong enough economic response to pay for itself. And so that, that's an important caveat when you're thinking about the impact of dynamic scoring and, and what we can reasonably say about the impact of various tax changes. Um, and as, as you can see on the slide, there are a variety of groups that do this from a variety of perspectives. Uh, you have the, the Tax Foundation, of course. Uh, the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center does excellent work uh, with modeling um, and is a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, organization. You have, of course, JCT that I just mentioned. And then you also have the Penn Wharton Budget uh, Model, which uh, is ran out of the University of Pennsylvania that also looks at the impact of, of tax on federal revenue. And as I mentioned earlier, there are also, of course, two other important questions that, that policymakers and others may have as it relates to uh, tax changes. Uh, the, the, the second, in addition to revenue, is the impact of a tax change on economic output or economic growth. Uh, and so you're looking at how any given tax change will impact long run uh, GDP, for example, that is a very common uh, metric that we use and, and report in our modeling. It's also important to look at the impact on American incomes or uh, GNP. Uh, to go back to uh, the review that Erica did earlier, right? Uh, you have both the output we produce domestically, but we also have the incomes that we earn, uh, which may or may not be exactly identical, particularly because of international flows, right? To go back to that GDP equation, you have exports and imports uh, and capital outflows and inflows that may mean that economic output and national incomes are not quite the same. Uh, and that's something we've actually built into our model over the past year uh, formally uh, to try to get at that difference. And that can often matter in the context of specific tax changes, uh, particularly taxes on, on savers. And so uh, each of these models, of course, is, is different, um, have different assumptions, but a lot of them, there are commonalities that are important, right? They all start uh, from a sort of similar foundations in the sense that they're looking at uh, a model of how labor and capital uh, produce or determine economic output through the Cobb-Douglas production function. They're looking at how marginal tax rates can impact uh, the incentives uh, facing uh, workers, uh, facing savers, and facing investors in the economy. Um, may make slightly different assumptions about how those relationships operate, and that, of course, feeds into uh, various interaction effects and to get at the final answer. Uh, but they're all trying to get at both the marginal tax changes, the incentives that folks face, and then also trying to figure out how this all adds up in the aggregate to uh, federal revenue uh, and economic growth. And then the third really important uh, measurement uh, that, that's mentioned here uh, that's important is the distribution of the tax burden, right? We may care about how much revenue 
a tax policy change will make. We might, might care about the economics of it uh, from a big picture perspective, but we may also care about how a given tax change will impact, say, the bottom quintile, the lower earners, or how much a tax change will uh, change the after-tax incomes of higher earners. And so you can look at the distribution of, a of the tax burden, both its existing distribution and how it will be impacted uh, by any given tax change. And a uh, very quick caveat here, uh, you, you noticed uh, me mentioning after-tax incomes. Uh, that can really be an important uh, and a helpful way of looking at the distribution of the tax burden uh, for two reasons. One, it shows the, the as close as we can get in policy discussions, the change in, in uh, well-being of folks uh, from a given tax policy change. Right when you're looking at sort of the net change in after-tax incomes, that's going to be tells you on net how better off or worse off someone may be due to a tax change. Uh, and uh, there's interesting debates about that, of course, but uh, that can be helpful to, to, to establish how a given tax change will, will impact after-tax incomes. And the second reason is it's a helpful measure of productivity, of uh, not productivity, of progressivity. Uh, and that's because uh, you can look at other measures like the share of the tax burden, uh, the share of taxes paid, for example, or the share of a tax change. The problem with those measures is that they often just pick up the underlying distribution of wealth, right? So it is often the case that you know a tax uh, a tax cut, if it's even across the board, is going to accrue a larger absolute amount to higher earners. Uh, but that's often just because higher earners are uh, are accruing more than those who are earning less. And so you're just picking up the fact that there is an unequal distribution of income or wealth. And so uh, that may or may not be a, an accurate way of establishing whether or not the tax code is becoming more or less progressive. Instead, if you look at the percent change in after-tax income, that can tell us if the tax code is becoming uh, more or less progressive with any given tax policy change. And finally, some, some quick differences on these different models. Uh, one, as Erica mentioned a few minutes ago, is on how open the US economy is. Uh, we tend to assume the economy is uh, very open, especially for, uh, for larger firms and corporations. Uh, international capital is fairly uh, easily obtained within the United States. That has important implications for the effects of tax changes on, on saving and on investment, uh, because uh, the more open the economy is, uh, broadly speaking, the less you think there will be crowd out of private investment uh, and the, uh, the, the less effect you may have on the economy with, uh, with any given tax change. So that, that's really important to think about, particularly in the context of taxes on savers, uh, because if you do believe that the economy is more closed, uh, if you increase taxes on savers, you will have a larger effect on economic output, generally speaking, than if you think the economy is more open because you have international uh, investment that can basically offset the decrease in private savings here, but that comes with a trade-off. And we'll get into this in more detail in future sessions, but the trade-off is, American incomes may go down more so than output, right? And why is that? It's because the output is going abroad. It's going to the new owners of that capital, the foreign folks who came in to replace private saving. So that's just one application of why that assumption is important. Uh, and finally, the, you know, the budget deficit issue, which is really patient right now, is also important uh, because uh, both uh, that short run assumption that uh, within Keynesian models about how it can help improve aggregate demand, as well as whether or not deficits can crowd out private investment also um, can impact the way in which certain models predict how output will be produced in the future. I just want to wrap up uh, this broad conversation before getting to questions about common high level misconceptions within tax policy conversations. Uh, we tend to think of these as the comparing uh, the uh, public, general public understanding of why tax cuts are good um, or why in particular contexts or uh, how tax increases may impact the economy versus how economists and neoclassical folks tend to think about uh, the relationship between taxes and, and the economy. Um, so one thing you'll very often hear, you know, with re particularly with retroactive tax cuts uh, is, hey, it's, it, it's great because we're going to get more money into people's pockets uh, and that's going to increase aggregate demand, right? And it's gonna produce uh, more output and uh, particularly in the short run. Um, the problem from a long run perspective, of course, is that a retroactive tax cut doesn't change uh, incentives to produce, right? Or to work because you cannot change uh, activity that you've already conducted in the past, right? So uh, those are generally seen more in our view as a windfall um, than as a way of leading to higher long run economic growth. Uh, 
Of course, there may be reasons to do it from a, a uh, relief perspective. One uh, right now uh, example of that is the exclusion for unemployment insurance that was introduced in the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that may or may not be justified from a policy perspective to help folks with surprise tax, surprise tax bills, but we shouldn't think of it as a way to get more money into people's pockets for more spending from a long run perspective, because it's not changing incentives that, that can't be changed from activity from uh, a year ago. Uh, similar types of, of thinking can, can uh, lead people astray as it relates to uh, repatriation, which was a big issue in the 2017 tax law, but bringing money home, right? We just have more cash. Cash can be helpful. Liquidity is an important component of business, of course. Uh, but the amount of cash that you have does not tell you whether or not certain investments are profitable or not. Um, you always have to think on the margin about this. And if, if in the extreme example in the US, there were no investments that were going to lead realistically to a return uh, that made sense for businesses, it doesn't matter how much cash they have, right? It doesn't matter how liquid they are. They're not going to go ahead and invest. Uh, and so uh, that component is equally and probably more important from, a, from an economic output perspective than bringing money home. Though again, liquidity can be helpful if there are uh, issues uh, there. Though generally speaking, because the economy is open and the international capital flows are pretty high, that's probably not gonna be a realistic problem for the US economy uh, in the short to medium run. Temporary tax cuts is a similar type of thinking on the folk side, right? Thinking that, it'll, that it will uh, put money into people's pockets. Again, in the short run from a Keynesian perspective, that may or may not be the case, but from a long run incentive-based perspective from to determine long run output, that's really not going to lead to long run growth. And that's because investment takes a long time to happen and it happens over a very long time horizon. Uh, and typically what we see with temporary tax cuts is you're just gonna see a shift in the timing of when folks take advantage of uh, certain investment opportunities, right? So if you know there's a lower tax uh, rate over the next couple of years, you may speed forward investments you were planning to do later on, right? Or you may even delay investment right now to take advantage of that lower rate. Uh, and so, uh, that's tend to gonna that's gonna shift the composition of when investment is made versus determining or changing the long run shape of that investment uh, and that output over the long run. Um, and then there are also important interactions and, and interesting questions about, for example, the value of deductions. There can actually be some unintended consequences of certain tax temporary tax changes or even phasing in a tax change because folks are gonna try to think about both the value of a tax cut or tax increase versus the value of deductions that they're going to make. And we'll talk about that more in detail in the coming couple of sessions. And finally, of course, uh, thinking about uh, tax reform, if you have a revenue neutral tax change, so say you broaden the tax base and lower the tax rate, that really classic tax reform, some folks may think, well, that doesn't really change anything, right? You provided a tax cut in one hand, you increase taxes on another, no effect on, on economic uh, output or incentives. Uh, our our core argument and key to a lot of our work is that that's not true. You can have revenue uh, neutral tax reform that improves the tax base, that improves incentives, and still doesn't lead to a reduction in revenue because you're getting the tax code right, you're setting the tax base right. Uh, and, and that's really helpful and important because then uh, it's sort of, uh, it's an underappreciated component of tax reform. It's something that a lot of folks can get on on a, on a more bipartisan basis. Uh, and it allows us to maintain federal revenue for important government services. Uh, and so, uh, of course, tax reform in 2017 tried to do that. Um, far from perfect, uh, lots of opportunities to continue the conversation about how uh, tax reform can, can happen on the base side, regardless of, of where we end up on the, on the revenue side of things as well. So I wanna make sure to leave some time for questions. I know some have been coming in over the past few minutes. Uh, and so um, we're gonna wrap up this part of the conversation and, and get to questions. Yeah, I saw one question come in about individual savings or national savings. Um, and in the equations that, that we were referring to, we're talking about national saving, but the, the intuition can apply for, for individual saving. Um, so if you think of when you, when you put your money in the bank, um, that's your saving, the bank can then lend it out to um, businesses or, or others to make productive investments. So even at the individual level, you can think of um, saving equaling investment. Yeah, we also had a good question, I think, uh, near the beginning about the Cobb-Douglas, which is why is uh, total factor productivity, it's known as A, which sort of buckets everything in other than labor and capital uh, when you're thinking about uh, economic growth. Why, why is there no power or exponent behind it? Let me show you the, for folks who are 
maybe didn't uh, see it or want a reminder, uh, basically this, uh, this last bullet here. Um, and uh, that, that's a good point. Uh, those exponents are showing for labor and capital, uh, the, the sensitivity of changing labor and capital um, with respect to output, right? So just, just as a reminder, right, if you uh, were to assume sort of a constant return or, or a value of one there, doubling labor will double output, right? Uh, if you have a, a higher uh, uh, exponent there, um, maybe doubling labor will more than double output. That is also true of the various things in A, right? You can think about classic example uh, is uh, technology, right? It's possible uh, that uh, electrification, for example, produced a higher return to output than uh, smartphones or future uh, technological innovation because there's diminishing returns, right? That may or may not be true, but that, that's one theory about why we've seen technological slowdown. Uh, that could theoretically be captured in some sort of exponent. Uh, typically, it's just not captured here because it's bucketing everything together. Um, but implicitly, there is there can be an assumption or a set of assumptions about how sensitive technology risk taking, uh, all the other factors that might be in there to uh, to uh, improving those uh, and the relationship between that and improvements in output for sure. Someone also had a question about uh, what applies uh, to the income tax will apply to the sales tax in terms of economic output. Uh, that's a good question. I think Erica, do you want to tackle that? Because you mentioned, talked about the sense of the um, impact of tax changes. Yeah, sure. So we, we would, in that situation, want to think about what incentives are, are being affected. Um, so, so an income tax um, can, it depends if we're talking about corporate income tax or, or individual income tax, but let's say we're, we're talking about both. Um, that affects both the incentives to, to work and to invest, um, depending on if we're, we're just talking about a sales tax um, or, or a value added tax, that's going to, um, depending how it's structured, typically not going to have um, a, a negative impact on incentives to invest. It can um, reduce the return to labor but generally, the, the a value added tax is going to be more efficient because it's a form of consumption tax than a tax on, um, on labor or on business income, which would be hitting capital too. So we would think that the, the value added tax would be more efficient, cause less dead weight loss, um, less distortions in the economy than, than income taxes. Yeah, and if you're more interested in how consumption taxes can be designed in addition to, to VATS and other, other, other ways to get at it, uh, tune in to future weeks because we'll be getting into that. And uh, there's some interesting and wonky applications there that can be helpful if, if folks are interested in that. There's another question on uh, the impact of the economy of increased uh, personal uh, savings by, the, by Americans during the pandemic year. Um, uh, that, that can, uh, can, that can be an application to back to the sort of the, the GDP equation, right? You're seeing an increase in, in personal savings uh, that may or may not be, be used productively uh, for uh, investment. That, that, that's gonna have, of course, um, more of a short run impact on uh, the economy in the context of you know, the business cycle than on long run uh, economic output. And so, uh, and that's why you're seeing a lot of discussion now in the context of that saving about uh, you have the relief component about whether or not folks are, are taken care of in the short run, but then you also have this concern about how the economy will, will quote, overheat, unquote. And, and that's more of a, a short run impact, right, of how, whether or not the economy is producing over and above or under its, its potential. And so you can separate out sort of that short run effect, which is important and a big part of, you know, the job of the Federal Reserve and others to get right versus what that potential actually looks like, right? And that potential is driven by a lot of the things we talked about today, which is uh, the various components of, uh, of the Cobb Douglas production function um, and uh, how we actually maximize that output over, over the long run, uh, which is, uh, you gotta get both components right. And that's, that's the tricky thing is how, you, uh, how to get both of those right. Because if you get anyone wrong, it, it can uh, be problematic. You can get long run growth wrong, big problem, big focus of ours. You can also get the short run wrong. A good application of that, of course, is the Great Recession. If you don't respond well to a downturn, that can permanently lower your potential output, which is a big problem, right? So um, still an important thing to, to pay attention to. Yeah, and on, on that question too, I think it's, it's just an interesting um, thing to look at. We had GDP fall, our, our output fell, 
but many people's incomes were maintained because of the actions that the government took. So there was a little bit of a divergence. You have, you have GDP falling, but you have personal income in some cases increasing um, throughout the year because of the, the policies that the government implemented to try to keep income stable. Um, and I think, I think like Garrett said, that's, um, that can have an impact on, on long run growth to prevent the, the sort of scarring that, that we saw um, from the Great Recession, prevent that from happening in, in some ways. I think there's still an ongoing question too related to overheating and related to how fast people are going to spend that, that savings that built up. Um, so so the, some of those questions are still ongoing. We're, we're going to see um, the effects of that throughout this year and next year. And then uh, I think we also have a question about uh, long run tax cuts. Uh, there's two interesting things here. One is I think the long run component, which is uh, we tend to find that that long run, and by long run you mean permanent tax changes are superior. Uh, even if it's if it's a, a tax increase, there is some advantage to having stability in the tax code. That's an important thing we think about from a principles perspective, is having a predictable, stable tax code. Because you'll often hear from folks um, who are making investment decisions, uh, and it's also true in, in the in the economics literature that. Uh, it's very hard to make investment decisions if you don't know how the tax code is going to be in five years. Uh, often they're they're happier with a tax code that's slightly less uh, amenable to investment as long as it's stable than one that's slightly more but always changing. Uh, and so stability is is really important, and that that's something that uh, especially the last decade, as, you, as you've seen, sort of polarization on this issue increase and uh, and tax policy change uh, more uh, bouncing around more. That can be problematic uh, for that uh, for that investment incentive. And then you also mentioned tax cuts, which I think this gets to Erica's point and she have thoughts on this, which is depends on, on the nature of the cut, right? If you are reducing taxes on marginal investments, right? Uh, that can be a way to improve growth. But uh, if you are you know, reducing tax on something that's, uh, that's not related to improving output, right? Uh, on say uh, a random windfall of some sort, that can be a, a way, a less efficient way of reducing revenue because you're not improving incentives to to invest or work. So um, the details matter, I guess, on, and it always depends um, on, on what exactly the tax change is, uh, but permanent tax changes are typically better than temporary ones. And I think those are all the uh, major questions we had. Um, and I think we can, we can wrap up just with a reminder that we'll be back here uh, next Friday. We have uh, uh, four more weeks to go. Next week, we'll be covering uh, a, a deep dive into the individual income tax code, important both for workers, but also for uh, businesses that are taxed on the individual tax code. So excited to talk about that. And of course, there's a lot of proposals to change it over the coming years. And so uh, that'll be a great conversation. And then in the coming weeks after that, we'll be covering corporate and international taxes uh, in, the, in the following week, and then getting into really exciting stuff, uh, applying specific uh, elements of what we're learning here in tax policy to uh, particular proposals. And so excited to do that. And of course, we're going to get your input on what you would find most helpful over the coming weeks uh, for those later discussions. Uh, so looking forward to that and uh, hope to see you again uh, next week for our next round of Tax Foundation University. Thanks so much. Take care.